one great thing about staying young and living living longer is that you'll outlive your enemies and it makes life a lot easier. For me, I, I've never felt this good. I've never been this sharp. I've never been this happy. I'm not going to say I've never looked this good, but I certainly feel young and and great with what I'm doing. What was it you said? F- the limbic system. Don't do what it says. Otherwise, all we'd be doing would be eating, sleeping, and having sex. Yeah. I know that sounds great, but you're not going to live that long, unfortunately, especially if you're doing them all at the same time. That's a really, 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 really good question. No one's ever asked me that. But the answer is that... Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the show. I am joined by Dr. David Sinclair in Style Magazine referred to you as a Sydney-born researcher who is a rock star in the longevity field. In 2014, he was voted, alongside the likes of Jeff Bezos and Beyonce, one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. David, welcome back. Oh boy. Thanks, Chris. What an intro. (laughs) Beyonce. Do you ever think that your work would take you into the the echelons of Beyonce? Uh, I guess I I dreamt about it. (laughs) It seems like you're everywhere at the moment. Are you? It feels like you are. No. You are I, everywhere. I, I, I mean, I came out of, out of the uh, pandemic you know, in, with a rush. Uh, a lot of people wanted to see me. So that's why it feels like I'm everywhere. But uh, no, I've been very quiet. Uh, even social media, I wasn't uh, as active. But I'm certainly dying to be out there um, communicating, talking about my next book. The old one's selling really well. So I, people want to hear what I have to say. So I don't mind being a, a scientific communicator because right now there's a lot of BS out there in terms of information. And uh, I think people like me need to step up. You've hinted at the new book. What can you tell us about what it is? Okay. Uh, so it's. I have to be careful not to give it away because someone probably will bang it out and beat me to it. But it's a, it's a, a look at how did we end up in this world that we live in, that we've created, and the effect it's had on our bodies over the last six million years. Technology is great, but it also makes us weaker as a species. And many of us are living lives that are extremely unhealthy because of it. And we have to use the four traits of humanity that separate us from animals uh, to get us out of this mess, uh, because they got us into this mess. Uh, And I'm talking about the fact that I'm sitting in front of bright lights, staring down a computer, sitting down, uh, we're all eating too much, too often. Uh, these things we've created, and and it's beyond that. Actually, our bodies have evolved to be pathetic because our technology has replaced the need for big muscles, uh, and instead we look like a lollipop. We're unfit for purpose. Exactly, and you know, I mean, I'm in Boston and in the winter when you were here last to to talk. Put us outside, and in 15 minutes, we're probably going to be dead. That's that's not a very strong species. You know, mo- most animals around here live the whole year outdoors. Uh, we're not built for that anymore. And there's no going back, right? We have to keep innovating to fix the problems we've had, created, uh, and uh, and to make sure that we continue to improve our lives. Uh, and it's, it's not clear whether we can ever get off this treadmill. When are you aiming for publication for that? I know this is like the the author's nightmare question, but when are you mm. aiming for it? Uh, well, yeah, probably sometime uh, next year. Um, but it's it's going really well. My co-author Matt Laplante and I are uh, best buddies, and we this isn't work for me or him. We we just laugh our heads off. And is that going to be the the guy that you're going to do your YouTube mini series with as well? Is that the same dude? That's the plan. Yeah. So we're going to do some pilots to see how we work on camera. Um, if you've read, I, I think you've read, but if anyone has read Lifespan, or actually more importantly, listen to it, Matt and I kid around in between the chapters, and you can get a sense uh, of, of what we're like. But uh, he, he's great. He's, he feeds off me. He's a, he's a journalist, not a scientist, so he can ask all the dumb questions. Uh, and then I can tease him about being stupid. That's really great. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, so since we last spoke, I've really fallen in love with evolutionary psychology. One of the questions that has been in my mind ever since we spoke is the purpose to dying. Because I thought that we were supposed to be adaptive fitness maximizers, and surely that means that having a certain end to life is a bit of an error. Like, Why haven't we just been evolved to become immortal? Well, we, we only evolved to stay, stick around for as long as we need to to replace ourselves. Richard Dawkins put it pretty well. 
our genes get to move on, but we don't. Um, and, and that's the case. We haven't really evolved into our station in life. Whales have. They're at the top of the food chain, uh, and they can live hundreds of years, bowhead whale being the longest. Um, conversely, mice get picked off in a year or two. They don't bother building a body that lasts 100 years because they won't be around anyway. <clears throat> and with that energy that you save living longer, you actually can put it into reproduction, which mice do. And we're somewhere in between. And the problem is we haven't been at the top of the food chain for that long. We used to be picked off by cats and, and pretty much even spiders uh, in the savannah. And what we need to do is to engineer ourselves to live longer. We're not going to evolve fast enough for any of us to, to matter or so, benefit. So the length of time that we stay alive is almost like a um, predictive risk mitigation from our uh, bodies. I, yeah, thinking out loud, I, I think it's it's more like um, planned obsolescence. Evolution's not going to put too much effort into keeping our bodies young if it doesn't need to, because it, it could then put resources elsewhere. Uh, similar to, I don't know, a phone these days. No one expects to have it 10 years from now, so they don't build it to last that long anyway. And that's what we are. Um, but if we stuck around for another 20 million years as a species, we may evolve to live hundreds of years, uh, but that doesn't really help us right now. And un unless we solve this problem of people getting sicker and sicker longer and longer, and the economic burdens of that, we as a civilization uh, may not make it more than 100 years from now. What do we gain then? Presumably, if we are sacrificing longevity for something, is it are we stronger than we would be? Are we faster than we would be? Is our metabolism more efficient than it would be if we were planned to live for 150 or 200 years? Yeah, usually it's a trade-off in reproductive rates. Uh, you look at whales, how often they breed versus a, a mouse that can have uh, you know six to 12 offspring at once. We're somewhere in between. And if we just evolved and we didn't do it, if this was not human-directed, uh, we would probably live for a couple of hundred years and be less fertile and kids, we may not be able to have kids until we're in our 30s biologically. We'd slow all that down and stretch out life, uh, which sounds good to me. That's what you're trying to do. So it's so strange that um, essentially what you're aiming for here is to kind of jump the queue. We don't have to wait a few hundred thousand or a few million years for evolution to do it, to realize we're almost knocking on the door of evolution and reminding it, look, there aren't any threats anymore. We've completely nerfed our environment. Let us live for as long as we want to. Well, yeah, that that's exactly what I'm saying, though. I don't know if we'll ever be immortal, but gaining an extra 15 years isn't that difficult. If you just do the right things that we all know are good for us, uh, don't smoke, do a bit of exercise, eat less frequently, get some good sleep, have friends, these things will get you another, on average, another 14 years versus someone who doesn't, don't smoke is an important one. Uh, but the technologies that we're inventing as a field and in my lab uh, could get us beyond that. So, you know, we're talking about it within our lifetimes, being able to be 90, 95, even 100, still play tennis, hang out with the grandkids, if you've got them, great grandkids, probably. Um, this is not crazy anymore. And in fact, we've got signs that we can not just slow down aging, but reverse it, which I'm pretty excited about, to say the least, because I used to think that uh, we wouldn't see these changes in our lifetime, but they're happening right now, and uh, it's it's far quicker than I thought it would be. It's like uh, the Moore's Law of longevity research. It is, and we're actually helped by Moore's Law. We In my lab, we crunch about a terabyte of data uh, every week. It's speeding up. Probably in a few years, it'll be a terabyte per day, and so we rely on that. We also can sequence your genome. Uh, in a day for $100 uh, and can be done on a little device like this. It used to be $2 billion uh, 20 years ago. So Moore's Law is helping us in genetics as well. That's funny. So you, you mentioned fasting now, eating less. The mechanism of fasting, how it works, where does mm -hmm. that come from? Is it the restriction of the nutrients or is it the discomfort of feeling hungry? Well, uh, it's not exactly clear. It might be a bit of both. That So m mostly, the good news is that when your body doesn't have spikes in blood sugar from eating, 
and doesn't have a lot of amino acids around from eating a steak, it will go into a defensive mode. We know that my lab published this in 2005 uh, from a rat study that when you're hungry or calorically restricted, we used to call it a lot, um, the levels of longevity genes go up. Uh, we studied we study one called SIRT1, S-A-R-T-1. Uh, but now basically the, the concept is when you're not eating and your body is experiencing uh, low glucose and has to make its own glucose, uh, it will go into this defensive mode and you want to maximize that. So I, I go for at least 18 hours a day without or trying not to eat. And I compensate with tea and coffee. And the interesting thing is I don't feel hungry anymore um, unless I'm super stressed, but that doesn't happen that often. Do you need to feel the hunger? I'm not sure. Um, I would love to see definitive evidence of that, but it might be true because the brain does control aging as well. That would be interesting, right? How much of the effect of the fast comes from the discomfort of sensing the fast and how much of that is perhaps being curbed by the hot drinks, which you advocate as one of the ways to kind of get through a fast a little bit more easily. Mm -hmm. I guess it's going to be difficult. You would have to use some sort of calorie-less stomach filling like flumps or something to well so interestingly uh in the 1930s uh 35 clive mckay and his colleagues who studied caloric restriction actually were one of the first groups to report that if you feed rats instead of food you give them cellulose with a little bit of food which is the same bulk uh they do live longer so i you know I, that's why i, I lean towards the feeling of hunger not being as important as just maintaining your, your blood sugar levels um, at a steady low level. That's interesting. So, okay, so beyond fasting, optimal diet makeup for you is lean towards vegetables, colors, stressed vegetables and, fr and stuff like that. If you eat just your one meal a day, what do you tend, what does that tend to look like? What's sort of typical David Sinclair dinner? Well, there really isn't one. If I'm eating out, yeah, it's God very knows. different. Um, Roll the dice. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I'll avoid fried food and a lot of meat. Uh, I just can't digest it. My my bacteria in my gut don't care for it anymore. They they those those guys died out a while ago. Uh, so I, I can't I cannot eat big heavy meals with meat unless you know I train myself and I, I I don't do that. So a typical meal, if I'm at home, I might have a, a little bit of cheese, some vegetables. I'll cook some up or even eat them raw with a with a dip. Uh, usually I'm working. If, if so, nobody's visiting, I'm actually just grazing while I work, and that's my dinner. Um, I don't really at home focus on making meals. Um, I'd, I'd rather just uh, get other stuff done. Uh, but it, eating out, here's, here's an important point. If, if somebody has a dessert, you know, I won't typically order a dessert. I haven't since I was aged 40, and that's over a decade of, um, ago. But I will steal a spoonful of, of cheesecake. <laughs> Someone else's. You gotta, you gotta live. What's the point of living longer if it's not so enjoyable? So that's the other point, which is, you you wouldn't want to go from a standing start to what I do, because it it you'll have habits that are really hard to break. Just putting stuff in your mouth and chewing is a habit. Um, ask anyone who's been a smoker about that. I think we like as mammals, uh, we like to suck on things and chew on things. So there's that to overcome, and that takes a couple of weeks at least to get used to. So go steadily um, and try skipping one meal if you've never tried it, either breakfast or dinner. Um, eat, eat breakfast or eat dinner, but don't do both. Someone should write a protocol for that, like, you know, just a really good blog post about how to, because I've seen many about how to do intermittent fasting, but very few about how to transition from a normal or a more typical eating state into a fasting state, you know? Day day one to five, try this. Day five to ten, try this. Day, f you know, that would be someone do that. Someone can someone can write that for us. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one that you've got a problem, or that there is a problem with eating lots of protein and regularly coming from a gym bro background. Obviously, that makes me want to be violently sick. Um, if someone wants to try and maintain muscle mass or even increase their muscle mass. Is it going to have to be a trade-off because there's a maximum amount of protein that you can absorb within one meal? Increasing the frequency that you eat that protein at is good for muscle synthesis, but bad for longevity. Is there any sort of insight you've got there? Right. Well, if, if you want to be a bodybuilder, um, especially professionals, uh, what I do is, is it may not be optimal, though 
you know, there's a fair number of athletes who say plant-based diets are equal or better. Uh, I'm not an expert on that. But what I can tell you is that, I mean, I, I've built up my muscle mass on a diet like I have. Um, I don't know if anyone can tell, but I'm in better shape than I've ever been since, you know, I'm back to my body as that I was when I was 20. Um, and so I don't find that my diet prevents me from gaining muscle mass or working out. Um, I suppose if I wanted an extra 5% gain, I, I could do that. But for me, just being healthy, fit, feeling good and lean is, is my goal. I'm not out to uh, win contests. How come that, sleep isn't a hormesis stressor like fasting or exercise well it's an it's anti-hormesis um it's it's necessary for for long life and health there's no question about that um you mean a lack of sleep why doesn't yeah, that yeah. work yeah yeah why can't you because you're saying fast it's uncomfortable it makes you feel it, it makes you live longer we're in scary mode we need to extend our life or else we might not be able to reproduce before we die so knuckle down yeah. and the same thing goes for exercise you're under stress why not just why, why isn't sleep or a lack of sleep have the same impact that's a really 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 good question no one's ever asked me that but the answer is that the, <laughs> longev the longevity gene that we study that's really we think it's really important for uh, for human longevity too is part of the the circadian clock and when you mess that up either through lack of sleep jet lag or just aging which diminishes the clock's ability to form high peaks and low peaks, um, then it, it, it impacts your longevity probably because it's affecting uh, your ability to fight disease through longevity defenses. But it's a, it seems to be a positive feedback problem, which is that if you don't get enough sleep, you screw up your aging, and then you age, and aging screws up your sleep. And by the time you're elderly, you're not sleeping well, uh, and uh, you probably you're you're under this accelerated aging program um interestingly that i talk a lot about nad which is part of my research controls this cert one defense system and the levels go down as you age but they also go up and down during the day as you're waking up you start to make more nad and if you disrupt that nad level you disrupt your sleep and so that's why i tell people if they're going to boost their nad levels do it coincident with the clock as it's rising hit it then, which is in the morning. Because I know from experience that if you take it late at night, you're going to bump up your body, make it think that it's the morning, uh, and you'll you'll have trouble sleeping. It'd be like taking melatonin to wake up and cortisol before bed. It's just not in line with the natural circadian rhythm. Right. But I find, and this is just anecdotal, uh, I find it's very good raising NAD levels uh, when you get to a destination in a different time zone. Which makes sense, right? That that you're able to control the body's clock and reset it. What if it's 10 p.m. at night? Uh, where in my destination? Yeah, then then I'll 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 fast until the next morning and then take a hit of uh, NAD booster in the morning. God. And then I feel great. I don't I don't have jet lag anymore. You have managed to fix that problem? Yeah, for myself for sure. There's been some research into melatonin recently, hasn't there, around longevity, or at least I keep on seeing it popping up here and there. Have you looked into that at all? Oh, well, I read the literature. It's hard to keep up uh, with all of it, but I don't think um, I've seen anything amazing about melatonin in years. And when you start to see a big gap in discoveries in science, you start to wonder, is it really reproducible or not? But if, if there's something new, I'll definitely send it my way and I'll report about it in public. I'll have a look. Um so sleep for longevity, does anyone now, I mean, I, I can't believe that anybody in this world, after Matthew Walker just and red-pilled everyone on the planet with his book, I can't believe that anyone doesn't really value it. How often do you think, or how often do you in, encounter people that don't understand the the price they pay for poor sleep? Uh, not not very often. I think I've got his book on the shelf up there. Yeah, there it is, yeah. next to my rocket ship. <laughs> uh, so it's... Uh, it's much more, I mean, thanks to, to the book, Matt's book, it, it really is in public's consciousness. Now, I, I don't talk to everybody, and I tend to talk to people who approach me and they're, they're interested. Already in down the rabbit hole, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, it's it's night and day, excuse the pun, um, <laughs> in the public's eye, uh, the value of sleep. Uh, but I find that some people get stressed out about not sleeping, which makes things worse. So you have to be careful not to worry too much. What I did was I, I, 
I have one of these aura rings which tells me <laughs> when I've had a bad night's sleep. And that's not so much to tell me that I need to take it easy. I mean, I can tell everyone knows when they feel crappy, but it's more about reflecting on what happened the night before and what might have caused it. Maybe a big meal, too much alcohol, that kind of stuff. I had a uh, author on the show talking about some of the challenges of tech addiction and wearables addiction is now uh, another thing where he was talking about um, people who have to hit their 10,000 or 15,000 or 20,000 steps a day and their husband thought that this particular woman was having an affair because she'd always leave the house at 10 p.m. at night and it turned out that she was seven and a half thousand steps under her so she's there power walking around the neighborhood and Mm -hmm. her husband thinks that she's off having sex with the neighbor or something like that, very very briskly walking to have a, a quick fling that lasts for about seven minutes and then coming back. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it does become addictive, but it's better to be addicted to that than a lot of other things. Uh, I think that the future is that we will know way more about our bodies than than we know about our cars. Right now, it's the opposite. I mean, who who would drive without a dashboard? But how many of us have tracked our bodies over the last 10 years like I have? And what's coming in the, the very near future, and I already am in this future, it's just, you know, I'm one of the, on the you know, front row seat. Um, you'll have a ring, you have a watch, but more importantly, your doctor will give you a patch to stick here, either just before the visit, maybe a week before, or if you just left hospital. And then eventually, you wouldn't leave home without one because you'll, you'll need it. These devices are, instead of going for an annual checkup, they'll measure you a thousand times a second. Um, and they're real. They exist. I've got one just in my in my bag. I usually wear it. You push a button. It syncs with your phone. Your doctor can see the results. Um, and they'll tell you if you get sick, if you're going to have a heart attack in the future next week. Um, they monitor your breathing, your temperature, your heart. And it's uh, in the U.S. FDA approved. So these are true medical devices, not not toys like these things. <laughs> Didn't you say it can work out which side you slept on, whether you slept on your right or your left last night and stuff like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, they're seeing a lot. They're, you've got to give up some privacy. I was going to say, yeah. This, dude, one of the best things that I've heard you say was someone can steal your credit card once, but once your health records are public, that's for life. That is going to be health record security is going to be a huge thing. As you get all of these crazy insights and you're potentially able to look at the project out someone's someone's life, that's implications for employment, for relationships, for insurance, for everything it is but we already live in that world we shouldn't be scared of it now we're talking about gaining an extra 10 probably 20 years for some of us with this technology you have to take you know take technology for what it is and already our medical records are digitized and can be stolen but they're not so there are really robust mechanisms in place and laws right now about health uh, data security and we'll strengthen them but right now, I'm, I'm not concerned. I think the, the benefits far outweigh the risk. And I, I haven't seen anybody's genome get hacked or stolen yet. <laughs> um, I, am, I am building a company uh, that, that will tell you your biological age and, and ostensibly how to slow down the process and reverse it with all the latest technology. Um, and I've, I've got a website if anybody wants to sign up. And Chris, we can do you Amazing. as one of the early adopters. Um, what's the website? the website? The website is drsinclair.com. Doctor is spelled out, not dr, D O C T O R, sinclair.com. Get on the wait list and, uh, you'll be one of the first people on the planet to have this test done. Um, and, uh, I'm sure we'll offer some discounts early for, for early adopters too. I love it. What do you want to be able to measure through a bio device that currently it's quite hard to measure? Right. Um, well, first thing is that that'll be a mouth swab. So the, the age of your body that will tell you your mm -hmm. biological age, it's just an easy, you don't have to spit. You don't I mean, have aside to from blood. that, so let's look at the wearables that you've got on now. You can get HRV and you can get what side you slept on and you can get blood glucose yeah. through these insulin -y things. What's missing? What, 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 do you, what well, would you like someone to bring up the technology to do next? Yeah, I know. I heard the question. I was going to get Sorry. to it. I just forgot to mention the other stuff. The... Uh, Fair enough. So I would, I think blood glucose on a patch would be great rather than sticking a needle. That's coming. Oh yeah, I've seen that. I've seen the in the middle of those things on the back of people's arms. It looks like a no. It's a dangerous. I don't know. I'm I'm not fantastic with needles. <laughs> well, 
Well, I don't find it pleasant to put in. You actually have to push a button and it hammers it into your arm. And I, I don't like needles either. I, I get scared of it. Once it's in, it's okay. But the thought of it flying into my skin is not good. And I, on Instagram, if you want to check it out, I pulled one of these off my arm. There's blood there. I pulled it apart. You can see the inner workings and the needle. It's up there. Um, David Sinclair, PhD, if you want to check it out. But um, yeah, what would I like to measure? I'd like to know amino acid levels, ketones, um, inflammatory molecules, sex hormones if possible, um, calorie counter. That'd be great. Just an accurate one. Yeah, so I don't have to think about it. You've I don't got, count You've calories. got an Apple Watch. Do you, are you not, not convinced with how accurate the daily calories are if you were to run that through? Well, don't you have to enter the data? In terms of what your expenditure for the day or your input? Your oh, no, I'm saying what's gone into your bloodstream. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, no, that would be like, I don't know, that would be like my fitness pal on, you'd have to, some sort of barcode on the inside of your mouth that automatically... Yeah, that would be insane. So I'm working on that. I, I have no idea how you even solve that problem. Like, what do you do? Do you have like a little infrared scanner in the back of your throat? Is that right? Okay, David's had three gulps of water. looks like half an apple there. Uh, let's put it this way. <clears throat> we haven't filed all of our patents yet, so okay. let me finish this up. But uh, you know, often when, when I dream of something that I really want to see on the planet, uh, I just go do that. It honestly, man, it blows my mind how much stuff it is that you do. Like, I, I, I'm aware that you're supposed to be at the forefront of longevity and research and, and getting stuff done. But this is like, even the last time that we spoke, you were talking about how briefly you're, you, you tend to get these um, IP sales and stuff comes through and then it's really, really good. And this is a, a period where I've you've got tons of money that you don't really know what to do with. And then you just decide to go and spend it all on creating something else that's crazy. And you have sort of a circadian rhythm of finances as well. And it just feels like, I don't know, it's cool. It's cool that you've got someone who's so reckless in a way, kind of at the forefront of this. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's not the right word to use, but uh, let's say I'm amplifying my impact by reinvesting the dollars that I make into new technologies uh, and it's working it's really working i've invested in probably 20 companies now um, and they're all really exciting and they do not just longevity work but virus detection revolutionizing uh, microbiology uh, we can look at the the structure of the cell now in three dimensions one of the other companies there's a lot going on um, and i guess i just put a deposit down and expect a return on most of them if so far I haven't lost any money, so which is pretty cool. But, um, you know, I, this is one of the reasons I need to live longer because some of these companies take a while to get my return, <laughs> especially drug companies. I can't but, believe uh, that the, the main it, reason it, for it, your it, longevity it, desire is so that you can see the returns in your financial investments. Yeah, it's not a very good uh, algorithm, is it? But uh, actually, one of the things that I like to say, and it's, it's, it's partly true, is one great thing about staying young and living living longer is that you'll outlive your enemies and it makes life a lot easier so i'm i'm finding that's actually true <laughs> <laughs> all right so talking about exercise your exercise um prescription for longevity seems like quite a low dose of movement to me it's like 10 minutes out of breath a couple of times a week is that a minimum effective dose or an optimal one minimal okay have you got any idea yeah. what an optimal one would be no one does, um, but it's somewhere between running 10 minutes three times a week on a treadmill and running 20 miles a week, um, something like that. And it's there's a lot of studies, so it's it's really hard to say which is the optimum. And there are different types of exercise. There's running, there's cycling, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, at a minimum, lose your breath um, two, three times a week. And if you can't do that, if you're too old or too lazy like, like I am uh, generally, uh, long walks are great. Um, I, I like to lift weights. So usually next to my desk, I'm moving house, but usually I'd have some weights just next to me. Um, and so when I'm bored or feel a little bit restless and I've been sitting down, I'll just pick up weights. And, uh, you know, you don't have to go to the gym, just have these sitting around next to you. And I find that to be really great. And I do my exercises with a little bit lighter weight than a bodybuilder would. I haven't told anybody this, but this is what I do. Um, I do a lot of reps 
and I'm doing this and this during the day. And I do many reps and I do them fast because that also gives me the aerobic exercise as well as builds up my muscle. Now, I have a gym, um, so I do more serious weights. But in my office, I'm doing high reps and it's aerobic and, and muscle building, which, you know, I've been optimizing this for my body for the last 30 years since I was a kid. Um, and I don't know if it works for everybody, but um, for me, I, I've never felt this good. I've never been this sharp. I've never been this happy. Um, I'm not going to say I've never looked this good, but I certainly feel young and, and great with what I'm doing. Well, you had to lift your shirt up to clean the camera lens before we got started, and you, you're looking lean at the moment. You lost whatever it was, 12 pounds since February? Yeah, my, I found my six-pack. It was somewhere under there. Yeah, uh, man. That's awesome. Well, I, I, another... Um, advocate i guess similarly within this space although a little bit more towards the performance endurance sides ben greenfield and he tells me that um trying to walk through his office he says is like doing an obstacle course because he's got a kettlebell here and he's got a resistance band there and during he's got a uh, treadmill desk that he walks on with one of these self-powered banana treadmills are you going to show me a treadmill desk underneath your desk i'm going to show you what i have under here which is cool i don't know who makes this thing but what's that a, what that looks like a torture machine no. Oh, is it a stepper? Is it a stepper? It's a stepper under my desk. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you get bored and restless, I suppose just turning around and having something to do. Have you had a look at the impact of sitting or being sedentary on longevity? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the classic quote is, uh, it's as bad as smoking now. That may or may not be true, but it's certainly bad for you. I can speak from my own experience that I sat down for two years to write Lifespan, the book. By the end of it, I couldn't walk properly. I had a cramped up piriformis muscle that runs through your hip bone. And it, it took about o o over a year to fix it. And uh, that's just one example of, of the problems you can have from sitting. But, you know, if you're sitting, it means that you're not moving your heart, you know, training your heart. That's the main problem. And also you get the obesity that comes with it or the, the weight gain. And there's very few things in this life you can do to accelerate your body's clock faster uh, than to gain uh, a lot of uh, white adipose tissue or, or you know, uh, fat on your body. Now, I'm, I'm not, you know, telling everybody they have to be, you know, have a six pack. That's not the, really the point. That's a, that's a choice. Um, but you want to maintain a healthy weight. Uh, BMI, for me, optimally looking at the science is around 23 um, different races and sexes are different of course uh, but the point is that there is an optimal weight for longevity that you can hit um, I write about it in lifespan if you want to look up the references and all of that um, but I was talking about this with uh, Joe Rogan uh, just last week that you know we talk about being healthy weight and lean and 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 optimizing our bodies, not because we want to shame anybody else who isn't. I mean, I, I've been pudgy for some of my life. What we, we do it out of love. We really just want everybody to feel the way we do and have the confidence that we do. And that comes from working a little hard, sometimes going without some things that you'd love to eat or do, uh, or doing some things you don't want to do. Um, but in the end, it's so much, it's so worth it. And the gains you get at the end of your life uh, will re really make it worthwhile. But think about anyone that's in a new, that's found a new productivity app, right? Or joined a cult or joined a new religious movement that they makes them feel whole, makes them feel good. They become evangelists for that movement, right? Dude, you got to try this new note-taking app. You got to try this new workout. You got to come to this new nightclub or whatever it might be, because I want you to experience the thing that I've had. And it, you are right. It seems like um, for some reason, the empathetic position in terms of trying to get people into a position of health doesn't really seem it doesn't feel like that gets sort of felt it feels dictatorial and, and oppressive as opposed to empathetic and encouraging yeah well you and i are trying to hit the right tone here and and i think that it's worth saying again it, it's hard to go from a standing start to extremes you just have to do better every day and you'll fail some days I'm not perfect, um, and nobody is, but as long as you keep at it, it's all about 
every day trying to do better. Um, and in fact, that, that's that's the goal in life anyway, at everything you do. But for health, it's really important because our bodies are trying to fight us. Our bodies want to sit down. They want to eat sugary and fat, fatty foods. And the food industry designs the food to activate those pleasure centers. So, it, you know, we've got got the uh, the marketers and, and uh, food producers against us. And I'm trying to even the, the level the playing field here. What was it you said? Fuck the limbic system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Don't do what it says. Otherwise, all we'd be doing would be eating, sleeping, and having sex. Yeah. I know that sounds great, but you're not going to live that long, unfortunately, uh, especially if uh, if you're doing them all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so what about emotional well-being? What, what, how does that relate to longevity? Obviously, it's very messy, I guess, as someone coming at it from a more scientific perspective. Is that harder to study? Uh, what is? So emotional well-being relating to longevity. Yeah, I see what you mean. Uh s- it's really important because the, there's a certain amount of stress that's mental stress that's good for you. Um, keeping you on edge, having a purpose in life, being excited, that's all good. But you can overdo it and have anxiety. A lot of people do, especially having come through this pande- pandemic. That'll release cortisol, among other inflammatory stimulators, uh, which will accelerate aging. There's really no question that a, an animal that's stressed lives shorter. Um, if anyone's who's kept... Uh, fish in an aquarium can see that the stressed out fish that get picked on not only are smaller and have less color, but they don't live as long either. So you don't want to be that fish. Um, And so what I've done to use myself as an example is work very hard to overcome my anxiety. I am naturally anxious. I'm an overachiever. I worry about every mistake that I make, even a misspelled word on an email. But I've had to realize that life isn't that serious? You know, a serious day is when you see one of your family members die in front of you. And that happened to me. Everything else, it's a good day. You know, if you wake up in the morning, your heart is beating, uh, you've got friends, you've got your health. It's it's a good day no matter what. That perspective is so important. And it really is difficult, I think, to keep a hold of that, especially over the last year. Everyone's got so neurotic, right? Less novelty, less uh, time around other people, less being taken out of your own head. Well, yeah, I mean, it's been said, and I agree that that mental health is going to be the the disease of the twenty first century, because we've taken care of a lot of other issues. Um, but the world we've built around us, topic of my next book, is extremely stressful. Um, there's no doubt, and and social media contributes to that, and it's designed to be addictive. Um, you know, myself, I, I'm on social media, and I have to be very careful not to get distracted by it too much because there's actually there's actual work to do shit to be done and, yeah. and, and 150,000 people die every day from age related diseases so i got to focus um but anyway the, the the stress is there and it's nobody's fault but there are ways that we can overcome it there's mental exercises there's meditation there's breathing uh these are these are things and the online therapy is really taking off uh, and so if you if you do need help Check those out because I think they're going to be a real revolution in, in mental health. Betterhelp.com slash modern wisdom for 10% off your first month. Um, I read a study, a, a, calling it a study is, is giving it far too much credence, but I read an article that said that um, people without dogs or families die soonest. People who have families live longer. People who have families and dogs live longer again. But people that only have dogs live longest of all. Do you think that's true? Gee, I know that having a dog <laughs> makes you live longer. I know that having friends makes you live longer. And that data is really clear, looking at people across their life. I didn't know that just having a dog makes you live longer. <laughs> yeah, has anyone thought that it might be the friends that are holding you back that are just a byproduct of the dog? The dog's got friends. you got to walk the dog with the dog's friends. Get rid of the friends. Sweet. You and the dog. Well, uh, yeah, you know, I'll, gi- I'll give a, a scientist's interpretation. Uh, Dogs don't lie to you, and we spend a lot of our time worrying about motivation and is someone going to be loyal? Are they going to reciprocate? Dogs are just there. You don't have to worry. So that that whole part of being a human and interacting with humans, if you take that out of the equation, I bet you you lead a much less stressful life. I think as well, having an animal that is 
dependent on you. I'm still just all about Chris, mostly. But the times <laughs> that I spend around my buddies that have got kids or dogs or whatever, it really does just force you to remember, like, I am not all that's going on in the universe. There is other things out there. I can focus my attention onto this other animal that's dependent on me and I've got to look after it. And I, it, it has needs it's not just about you. And I guess that that neuroticism, that overthinking, that over uh, mm -hmm. uh, assessing of what's going on, it's going to help you to, to get that down. So having a dog is a mindfulness exercise is what I'm saying. Yeah, for sure. And it gives you purpose. Having a purpose in life is definitely helpful. And if you don't have a dog or you don't want a dog, find what you love and just do that. And you'll live longer. And you know, it's, a, it's a great thing when you can do it. And that's another reason to have longer lives, healthier lives. Because if you don't like the career that you started in your 20s, take some time off and start again. You, at 50, you know, I, I could potentially have another 50 to go just getting started. Didn't your dad change his career at 72 or something like that? Yeah, he's closer to 76, actually, and he's still going strong at 81. Yeah, he's a real beacon of hope, I call him. Good example to set. Have you been able to study the effects of loneliness or companionship on your mice? Is that something that you can do, or is it is it kind of hard? Um, we haven't, but we do cage mice either separately or in groups. I haven't seen that it makes a difference. Um, but then again, I haven't paid attention either. Uh, next time I come on, I'll have the answer for you. I'll, I need to text someone in my lab. Uh, who actually does the, the real work. I just get to talk about it. Yeah, I get you. You mentioned, I think it was on Rogan's show, where you said that um, sort of under the age of 25, you thought that um, supplementation and things like that perhaps were not quite so necessary, at least with regards to, I think, specifically NMN or NAD boosters and stuff like that. If you were, you know, 20s to, to sort of early 30s, would it just be focusing on diet, training, finding yourself some good friends and, and sort of getting some life skills? Or is there something else that you do? Uh, get a dog, yeah. Yes, get a dog. Everyone, this is the front end of the funnel for dogs. Affiliate link, dogs.com slash modern wisdom. 10% <laughs> off your first dog. Yeah, well, um, we're, we're also building a company uh, that has dog longevity products, uh, supplements. <laughs> so what, watch out for that. Uh, but yeah, in your 20s, I usually go by what's worked for me. In my 20s, I was a, a gym rat. Uh, I did aerobics. I did yoga. I watched what I ate. I didn't eat breakfast. I tried not to eat too much bad food. You know, but as a 20-year-old, you can eat pizza once in a while. So that, that worked for me. And I think that it makes sense given that the body's protective defenses against aging are still pretty high when you're young. NAD levels are high. So you should be okay. Um, can I say that it would, would not help to supplement? No, we don't have any idea. But it's, I think it's more important to start in your 30s based on my experience. Um, and, you know, there is still a risk with all supplements. There's no molecule that's perfectly safe. Even fish oil, I think, has warnings on it. So um, if you're 20 and you're going to do this for your whole life, that's a greater risk than someone like me who's 50, you could argue. Yeah, that's interesting because out of the tales, the extremes of your usage, if there is a, a negligible background risk to something that you're using, if you use it 5,000 times instead of 10,000 times, the likelihood of that risk has been chopped in half, right? It is, but if it's still only one in a million or one in a billion, it doesn't really matter. I mean, we know what's going to happen to us if we don't do anything. And that's, that's tragic and scary. Um, so, you know, in terms of the weighing up the risk, I don't understand people who say, oh, I don't want to take, take resveratrol because we don't have any proof that it works. Well, dude, it costs two cents a day. It's never hurt anybody as far as we know. And what's going to happen if you don't? So that's fine, but I'll miss you when you're gone. Can we go through your daily supplement routine now we did one two and a half years ago and i'm really interested to try and compare so morning to night what are you mm -hmm. what are you currently taking uh doses and such like yeah well actually it hasn't changed since i wrote uh lifespan 18 months ago so page 304 see the list um i've added a few things i work out more i'm doing more weights three times a day supplementation still nmn resveratrol some metformin 
Uh, vitamin baby D. aspirin? The baby aspirin, definitely. That's, if nothing else, protective against colon cancer, but probably other stuff too. I like to keep inflammation down. That's a hallmark of aging. Um, so I've added um, quercetin, uh, which is a molecule related to resveratrol, which is also uh, suppresses the activity of senescent cells. Um, and there's another one that I'm experimenting with uh, to have a look what happens. And I trust me, I'm 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 a doctor, right? I, I'm a, I'm a PhD. I monitor myself. I I know my body better than probably anyone on the planet, few exceptions. But I I know when something negatively affects me or positively, and so I I can do these experiments on myself. So the the one that I'm testing out is Fizetin, F I S E T I N N Fizetin. We showed in 2003 and 2005 in two Nature papers that it extends the lifespan of animals. Uh, small animals, worms and flies, but nevertheless, it's been now shown that it's senolytic. It kills off the senescent cells in the body, at least in mice, probably in humans, based on some human data. And so I'm looking at that. Um, other than that, that that's my life. I, I definitely eat less now. I've sk I'm skipping lunch, not just breakfast, routinely, and really enjoying that. Have you got any idea what sort of calories typically on a day you would end up eating total? No, I probably would have. One drink, so probably either a red wine or a whiskey at night with a salad, some cheese, a little bit, maybe a bit of shrimp, maybe some chicken if I'm eating out, but probably not often. Uh, but that's it. I, I tend not to eat more than half a regular meal at dinner compared to what I see everyone else eat. And that's so once a day? Once a day, yeah. Wow. And then I'm chewing on gum and drinking tea the rest of the time. I do have a bit of yogurt in the morning, which I freely admit it's, That's to mix a, your resveratrol in, right? Yeah, because the all these molecules, the polyphenols that come from plants, quercetin, fizetin, um, resveratrol, even curcumin, uh, especially curcumin, they're like brick dust. They don't they don't get absorbed. They they they're crunchy, so you have to mix them with something, olive oil or yogurt, so that they they get absorbed. And I know this from human clinical trials. I'm not just making this stuff up. And if you so if you have resveratrol with a bit of food and fatty food you get five times the levels in the blood. One of the things that I was really fascinated by after our first conversation was how passionate people were in the comments section and also messages and, and stuff that I got and then further conversations about longevity that I've had over the last couple of years. Do you notice this sort of within the longevity community that there is, it's quite a animated group. Why do you think that is? Uh, well, it's it's certainly growing. The number of people that are into this and excited by it, um, and the number of people who've now read my book, which is, it's going to be close to a million by now across the world in 20 languages, which is really mind-blowing. That yeah. happened. Um, so there is this um, zeitgeist, uh, or you could call it a mega trend, of people caring about their bodies and, and realizing that aging is in their own, the pace of aging is in, in our own hands. I, I like to say 80% of it is based on studies of twins. Uh, but yeah, they're very enthusiastic and we're getting more and more enthusiastic because the technologies and the discoveries and the knowledge about how to slow down and even reverse aging are coming out fast and furious. And I, I'm trying to read them, sort through them and give the best of them out uh, to the public on social media. But it, it's head spinning what's happening. You know, this paper that we published in December in Nature, which I'm, I have a copy here. I'm pretty excited. We got the cover. So here, here we go. Turning back time. Reprogramming retinal cells can reverse age-related vision loss. This is this thing that you did in mice whose uh, retinas you'd crushed, right? And then you... Yeah, it's, it's even better than that. We can rebuild a, um, an optic nerve, but we treated glaucoma. And also, we just took old mice that were blind and for the first time restored their vision back to normal. So what this tells you is you can reset the age of a tissue without any issues. Um, that tissues that are old and we think are gone are recoverable. And so what this tells us is that aging, first of all, there's a backup copy of the information to be young again, stored in our bodies somewhere. We are looking for where it is, but there is a reset switch that we found. And that as long as you know the trick, it's really easy, any student even a high school student could do this experiment. 
preferably not on them on their parents but uh <laughs> it's not that hard once you know and i think we've we've reached a turning point in being able to control the pace of aging in my lab we can accelerate aging in a mouse we can reverse it we're reversing age not just in the eye now but in the ear in the brain recovering the ability to learn um so th this is super exciting and it's taking the academic world by storm. There are a lot of labs that have jumped into this field, at least four Nobel Prize winners are now working on this, who've won awards for different things, but now are working on this, and more money coming in than ever before, both in labs, but also in companies, there's a lot of investment. So all of this, I think, I think if we look back at the history of the 21st century, this will dominate the first 20 years, and then what I'm talking about will be the most exciting thing over the next 20 years. Is everyone just holding onto your coattails? You mean riding them or holding them? I holding don't... them, just desperately trying to keep a hold of, of whatever oh. you're doing and thinking, like, just, yeah, well, you've got all of these new people coming in, investment, money, researchers. Well, you know, I'm certainly uh, trying my best to, to bring the world along with me, but I can't take credit for it. You know, there's hundreds of researchers around the world, seriously. Uh, and they don't go on podcasts, so you don't hear about them as much. But they're there and they've worked really hard. And they're brilliant. And we, when we get together, it's an amazing synergy because we're, often we're working on different pieces of the puzzle and they're finally coming together into one single hypothesis that hopefully can explain why we age. And as I wrote in my book, why we don't have to. What are your thoughts on the COVID vaccine? Have we got any sort of oh. concerns there? Uh, no. N no, nothing serious. Um, I, I talked a lot about COVID in the beginning of the pandemic, and then uh, I noticed, yeah, and then it and it really sort of you seemed like you'd done your work and then stopped. Well, like a lot of people um, who had kids, I needed to focus on my family, so I did that, and they're all good, and so I'm back back out. But uh, I, so I, I know enough to be dangerous about COVID. The vaccine, I know the people who make, literally invented, and the people who make the the Moderna vaccine, good friends of mine. Um, there's, there, it, it's not a concern. I mean, seriously, if, if you're worried about that, you should be worried about crossing the street. Um, there's, there's, it's, it's more likely you'll get hit by lightning than something bad will happen to you from a vaccine. There's, there's no chips from Bill Gates in them. It's a miracle of science, and we should embrace it. You know, scientists have saved the world here. We would have been done for. We would have lost many, many millions, tens of millions of lives if there wasn't a vaccine. So I, I I really don't subscribe to the idea that uh, we should avoid vaccination, or we we may as well just go back to the Middle Ages. What about five G? Everyone's got problems with that. Having your five G phone nearby or in your pocket, I've certainly seen some videos and stuff in terms of the radiation that comes off them. How does that affect longevity? Well, we don't know. We don't even know how how going through those airport scanners affects longevity. Uh, I try to avoid them if I can. I, so here's a funny story. I need to interject there. You told me, you told me that you <laughs> request a um, manual search, whatever yeah. it's called. I want. I'd rather not go through the scanner. I'll take this thing. Um, flying out of Boston, leaving your very office and your lab, uh, I, I requested that very same thing. Uh, to which the security guard looked at me, said, are you sure, sir? I said, yes, put my bags in the thing and tried to take me into a side room in which I would have had to have fully stripped down. Uh, unbelievable. I can't that's, believe that you tried terrible. to stitch me up to get me <laughs> to go into a room. <laughs> No, oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm adamant. I'm adamant. I thought to myself that Dr. David Sinclair has tried to stitch me up so that this big burly man takes me into a, a room and makes me take all my clothes off. Well, you're on to me. You do know it was April 1st when you visited. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. But uh, I, I, I've gone through scanners because currently my clearance isn't, isn't updated. Uh, and I wear this patch on my chest and they freak out when they see I've got a flashing light on my chest. They think I'm Iron Man or something. Not far off. Uh, okay, well, so 5, 5G is going to be all right then. We're not, we're not concerned yeah, about 5G. Yeah, I'm not worried. I've looked at the data. There's nothing that concerns me. There is radiation. I think we should study it. But uh, I, I don't think there's any evidence that it's going to be harmful. It doesn't damage DNA, which is what my main concern is, because that will age you.
What about Bluetooth headphones, stuff like that, same? Yeah, same. It's, it's low-dose radiation. You know, you, you can you can worry about this stuff um, or you can just get on with it. The scanners I particularly worry about because at least the early versions of those machines had penetrating radiation at a wavelength that wasn't healthy, and Europe banned them before the U.S. did. Um, and so I don't panic if I have to go through the scanners these days, but just if I have a choice and I can skip it, I will. But uh, yeah, for phones and all of that, Bluetooth, no. Nah. But I would like to test various radiation um, types on mice for their lifespan because you've hit on a good thing, which is often whether it comes to radiation or molecules that are in the in the environment, nobody tests the longevity of an animal because it, it takes too long, takes three years. Um, and so even while short term, it doesn't have any effect, it, it might speed up aging or do something else. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I found out that uh, a 20 minute phone call with your phone to your head is the same as being in a room with a Wi-Fi router for an entire year. So that was an interesting comparison in terms of the amount of radiation that comes off. Right. Well, if it doesn't change the epigenome, and that is what I believe drives the majority of aging, then I'm not concerned. But that's a good good experiment, actually, Chris. We could take these emitters, whether it's a phone or a router, or maybe even a scanner at the airport, and put just put cells in there and see if it disrupts the epigenome structure, so the three-dimensional structure of DNA. And if it does, then we then we probably should be testing a mouse or two. Uh, but if there's no effect, it'd be great to publish that because I think that that would allay a lot of fears. My first published paper. I can't wait. Is this what you do? Do you go to bed? Do you go to bed at night and think like, what my what mad experiment am I going to do in the morning? The same way that I go to bed thinking of questions for podcast guests. You just think about what mad experiment about longevity you're going to do the next day. Of course, that this is what I'm paid to do. But then you have an army of people that just go and do it. You just what do you do? You WhatsApp someone and say, right, I want to put. Can we put some cells in the scanner, please? Ring the airport, see if we can get a hold of one, make it happen. Yeah, I tend to be pretty stubborn. If I want to do something, I won't stop till it, somebody says yes. So, yeah, I've already looked into it. You can get these scanners. Uh, they're fairly expensive, but they they, they have them around the place. Um, I know people at NASA could probably call. Get all the ones from Europe that they banned. Get those. They'll be flogging them. They need yeah. to get rid of them. That's right. They're, they're probably in some uh, eastern country. Who knows? But um, it, well, I think we do need to have the government pay for this. Every time there's, there's new radiation, look at the rate of aging in an animal. That would be great. Because I think most it's not on anybody's radar, excuse the, the other pun, <laughs> um, that that this could affect the aging process and how would you know unless you tested it i saw on your instagram something about being able to stop or reverse gray hair what's going on there oh yeah so that wasn't that was another lab that did that but it was really interesting so that there are people it's pretty common actually that people can go temporarily gray from a lot of stress in their life and so the hair will start to grow gray out the bottom and then if they relax go on a vacation It'll go black again or brown, and you get this hair that's brown, gray, brown. But they've got roots coming through on a, a really bad hair dye. <laughs> it could be. Uh, anyway, so the, the, this researcher and his team plucked these hairs out and looked at what was going on at the molecular level and could see that there were changes that were associated with aging and its reversal, and which is exciting because it, if we can understand how this happens, we could not just reverse gray hair, uh, but also other aspects of aging in the body. And I, I like that idea that you can use hair as a model for age reversal. It's easier than re restoring eyesight, put it that way. You tweeted the other day saying, life's a journey, pick a worthwhile destination. What's the destination that you're working toward? Uh, well, the, it's really simple that the world is a better place. Um, down one level from that, that everybody in the world can live a better life um, and healthier life, longer life because of something that I did. Uh, more practically, it could be sim as simple as writing my books to give people advice on how to take their life into control, under control. And uh, ultimately, I'd love to have a medicine or two that can treat diseases and aging itself. Um, and uh, I feel like something is, I mean, the, the book Lifespan certainly was was more popular than I ever imagined. 
So I can tick that one off the list. But the destination really, it's an interesting destination because I don't know how far into the future we can go. I'm, I, I'm not making this up as I go along, but it is changing with every week, new discoveries that are coming out in my lab and others that are pushing that destination further out into the future and allowing me to do things with my life that I never thought that I'd have the chance to do. You and Beyonce, mate. <laughs> David Sinclair, ladies and gentlemen, uh, people want to keep up to date with your stuff. Where should they go? Also, that we you can donate as little as 10 bucks to my lab to help us buy some of this state-of-art of, state equipment. That's Sinclair Lab, SinclairLab.com. And then on social media, um, Twitter is David A. Sinclair, and Instagram is David Sinclair PhD. And I try to be as entertaining and educational as I can be. And oh, Chris, these, these sayings, somebody wrote a negative thing, as you do on Twitter, that, oh, scientists think they're philosophers now. Uh, yeah, we do. But not only that, these are sayings, if you read them, these are what I teach my students. And I figured, why just train 20 people at a time when I can give it to potentially millions? I love it, man. Until next time. I'd love to come back. Thanks, Chris. This is awesome as usual. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few months. And don't forget to subscribe. It makes me very happy indeed. Peace.